Nice. Nice. We got, we got a salted green on today, both of us. Yes. All right. Pick, pick, put, put down the Bud Light. What do you got? I got a little harpoon. They call it the rec league because that's about all I can play in these days is the rec league. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not even that. <laughs> that, that. I think that stands for like your body is wrecked. <laughs> Right? Well, that too. Well, I, I will do well at that then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, P hey, PB, this is a good one. We're going to talk a little playoff. We'll start it out with hockey because you got some splaining to do, my friend. Like I said, at the very beginning of the playoffs, there'll be no Florida team in the Stanley Cup championship finals, and it's looking that way. Right now, the Rangers are holding on. It's 0 0 in game three down there in the lovely Tampa Bay area in the second period. What do you think? I mean, are you surprised? First of all, obviously the Rangers won two at home. But up until then, the Tampa Bay Lightning were, if I get this right, 18-0 and 0 in the playoffs after a, a, a loss. So they had never gone back-to-back -back 18 straight times. And, and they did now. And, and they're, I'll tell you what, it's, it's the Rangers. The, the Tampa Bay is not losing this series. The Rangers are winning this series. Um, I would agree. Shesterkin is just unbelievable in the playoffs. All along, ever since they went down 3-1 to Pittsburgh in that first round, won three straight, they went down 3-2 to Carolina, came back and won that series. And here they are. Now, a little different position for them, right? Because now they're up 2-0. So let's see how they react when they're up instead of being down because they're used to being down. And um, But Shesterkin, to me, right now, is just playing out of his mind. And you got to give Zibanejad credit too, because he's putting up some serious points in the playoffs. I think he's like third in the in the uh, league in in points for the uh, playoffs so far. So I like what I'm seeing out of the Rangers. I think this is the Rangers winning the series, not Tampa Bay losing the series. It's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. I, you know what? I'm thoroughly surprised by the Rangers. I hate to be rooting for anything from New York, but I guess I'm kind of rooting for them. So we'll see. And by the way, they'll be the most obnoxious winners that we've ever seen since 1994. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know if they're going to be able to get past the uh, the Avs. We'll talk about the Western Conference here in a second. But the Avalanche, to me, are just they're, they're they're insane good. Well, let's talk about that because I really thought was that was going to be the better of the two series. And Edmonton, I mean, they're down 0-3 now. I mean, yeah, Edmonton down 0-3 with conceivably the best player in the game, Connor McDavid, on their team. Yep. And it's not like he hasn't been a factor. He has. I mean, that first game was, what, 8-6, to six, 14 goals? Right, right. Well, you know, you look across Edmonton, look at Dreisaitl, you look at McDavid, and you look at Evander Kane. Those three guys are, like, top three in the, in the playoffs in scoring and goals. And, I mean, they're, they're putting up some serious numbers. So, um, here's the opposite case. I think Edmonton might be, you know, giving this thing up more than, you know, the Avalanche going out and winning it. But – they got the talent. They got the players. Um, Mike Smith hasn't been, you know, killing it. But, you know, I, I still think that the uh, the Avalanche are the team to be. Here's the interesting thing about all those numbers, all those stats. I mentioned the three guys from Edmonton that are up there. But if you look at plus minus, yeah. the top five plus minus in the playoffs are all, with the exception of Connor McDavid, all other four are on the Colorado Avalanche. They don't have any guys in the top five in scoring and goals, but they do have the top four out of five in plus minus. And I think that's important because when you're on the ice, you're not letting up goals, right? And that's the important thing. Right. So that's hence why the Avalanche are in the position that they're in. So I can't see this. Well, even, even if they get in the shootouts, they showed show us in game one, right? They still won the game. I, I, right, exactly. And that's why I don't think Edmonton's got a chance at this thing. So let's look for Colorado Avalanche to make the cup, and they'll probably go up against the Rangers, it looks right now. I mean, the actual Rangers did score a little bit ago, so it is one nothing New York now. If they take this game and go up 3-0, we're in the same situation. So let me ask you a question. If they do go up 3-0, do you think both series sweep? And at this way, that's the way it's looking, right? I mean, you try to salvage that last game at home before you go on the road, but, yeah, I don't know. Imagine that. Ima imagine how great the first round was when we had, what, five game sevens in the first round, correct? Right. And everybody was talking about how great the NHL playoffs are of all the sports. 
And if you have two sweeps in these semifinals, so to speak, right, conference right. finals, that's that's a pretty poor showing at that point in time. That means right. the Stanley Cup has to be just a game seven to save the NHL, you know, from looking bad in these last two rounds. Right, right. And even last, even the last second round, it was a sweep too, right? So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, we'll see. All right, let's talk NBA because we get our green on. Boston Celtics playing the Warriors tonight in game two. The Celtics with a surprising game one win. They took the lead at halftime, then they went down by as much as 14 in the third quarter. We're losing by 12, entering into the fourth. Ended up rallying and basically had a 24-point turnaround in that game, which explain that. What do you think, PB? Yeah, I mean, the Celtics right now, they, they when they need to lock down on defense, they can lock down. And I, and I think that's that's the key. There's something, and, and I give credit to the coaching, but when they, they, they play the game the way it needs to be played, they don't get they don't panic when they're down big. They chip away at you. Um, the key to their the key to their game is making their shots. We we know that they they, they get the wide open shots. They, they pass the ball great. They move around great. If they're making their shots and then playing the defense that they're playing, this team is unbeatable. And I, well, I, I'll add the other thing. The other thing I'll add is the thing you and I, especially I, was very critical back before the calendar turn was how selfish they were, right, with one-on-one -on -one ball, like Tatum dribbling the ball for 20 out of 24 seconds on the shot clock, right? That's the other Achilles heel because sometimes they do fall into that mode a little bit, even in this last game, and that leads to trouble. So to your point, they got to make shots when they're open, and they got to share the ball because when they go dribble heavy, one-on-one, -on -one, ISO, that ends up killing them in the long run, right? So those are two things. Yeah. You, and then play defense. Yeah, Tatum does turn the ball over more than I'd like to see. Um, yeah. And that, that that could kill them. Turnovers could end up killing them. And we saw that happen when, in the Milwaukee series. When they started losing a couple games in Milwaukee, They were it, the reason was because they were just getting turn, tons of turnovers. So they got to they gotta cut down on their turnovers. But let's let's see. This game tonight, right? If they win tonight and take two, the first two in Oakland in Golden State, I mean, come on, are they? Is the series over, or can Golden State come back being down two zero, losing both games at home? Well, let's not forget the Celtics have been actually better off on the road during these playoffs, right? They're at right now, if I'm not mistaken, eight and two on the road in the playoffs, including two wins in the Milwaukee series when they had the home court advantage. So. You know what? I hate to say it, but I'm a little leery if they go up 2-0 because I guarantee they lose that third game. I, it's just unfortunate the way they play. They get a little too cocky, and they go down, right? So right now, to me, it's this. they got to keep Clay Thompson off the board like they've done. They've got to make Jordan Poole look like he's stuck in a pool. And then Jason Tatum can't be only scoring 10 points, 12 points in the rest of the series. I mean, he did great passing the ball, 13 assists. But we need points out of him because you're not going to get those games out of Al Horford and Derek Knight every single game, nor Marcus Mott making a couple of key three-pointers, right? Like like De Draymond said, Derek White, Al Horford, Marcus Mott, 15 three-pointers. And he shook his head like, we can live with that because I don't think that's going to happen again. It's basically what he was saying, right? Right, right. And if you're a Celtics fan, you're saying the obvious saying, hey, we kicked your ass despite Tatum only getting 12 points, right? So you can look at it both yes. ways. You really could. And you're right about the Celtics on the road. I mean, they won three in Miami, didn't they? They won three games in Miami because they went one and two at home. And they went, yeah, three, yeah. they went three and one in Miami. So you're right. They, they, they are a better road team than the home team so far in the playoffs. And it's hard to believe because, as you know, you've been there. The Boston Garden is absolutely, you know, those craziest, one of the craziest venues around. Boston fans are extremely loyal and loud, so that's why I'm just shocked that they don't play as well as they, they should at home compared to the road, right? I agree. I agree. Yeah. All right. Hey, uh, PB, something happened the other day in sports that made me think, let's talk about this a little bit. One of the rarest things ever in sports, baseball, is a guy hitting a home run from both sides of the plate, not only in one game, but in the same inning, that happened twice in the NCAA uh, uh, playoffs, high, uh, call, uh, baseball playoffs, it's Friday night. It's only happened four times in Major League Baseball. So let me ask you, 
If you're at a sports event, what is the rarest thing that you could ha happen to see at a sports event in your mind? Well, I know one of the rarest things that happens in baseball, to stick with baseball, is an unassisted triple play. I think it's happened 13 times, and the baseball's been around since, what, the 1870s, 1880s? So you're talking 150 yeah, they years of the game, and it's happened 13 yeah. times. So that's a pretty rare event. Yeah. But I, you know what I was thinking about? What were you going to say? I was going to say, but if you think, think about it, it's not like super, super exciting. You know what I mean? It, it, it's cool to see, but it's not like off the charts, like exciting. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Like I'd like to see a double play with seven guys involved. You know, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> How about this one? How about this one? I was thinking about this, watching a little golf. I mean, hole in ones is pretty hard as it is, but a par three is typically where it's at. I don't think I've ever seen a hole in one from a par four, never a par five. Imagine what that would be like. Yeah, I don't think. I don't know, on the pro circuit, I think par fives are at least 480, 500 yards or more. So I don't. And no human being can drive a ball that far. So I don't think a par five has ever happened. I mean, there might be some other courses that have short par fives with like a dog leg where you hit it over the trees, or there might be something. The course somewhere somehow, but on the pro tour, I don't think that's ever happened. A four, I'd have to research that. I don't know if a hole in one's ever happened on a power four before, but there's certainly some power fours that are drivable. I've played power fours that are drivable before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just think of uh, where the Deutsche Bank used to be played in Norton. There's a hole there. I, if I'm not mistaken, it's the 16th or 17th. It might be the 17th. I, I believe it's a four or five. But the way the ball, so it does make a dog dog leg left, but it's on a hill straight down. So you think about that. If you get that thing on that runway like a NASCAR track, right, it comes around the far curve and just keeps going, right, especially if, it, you know, the grass is nice and tight. Who knows? If they could travel all the way, you never know, right? That would be pretty cool. Yeah. Hey, what else you got? One. I got another one for you. How about, and this actually happened in the NFL in a playoff game, no less, I believe like three or four years ago. But besides that, I think it happened maybe somewhere in the mid to late 90s. A quarterback throwing a touchdown pass to himself. <sighs> that's a good one. That's a good one. And that's kind of exciting because it's a touchdown, right? So you're at the game. and you're Oh, you know, yeah. You know? But throwing a touchdown pass to yourself, um, Marcus Mariota did it in the playoffs against the Chiefs. I believe they actually beat the Chiefs in that playoff game. Uh, it was a 20, I want to say 2018 or 19. Uh, and I believe the last time it was done prior to that was in 1997. Brad Johnson did it. So that's oh. – Yeah. And I don't know if it's ever happened besides that. I'd have to go back and look at the research, but – that's, okay. a pretty, all that's right. a pretty rare event. And typically, all right, so for those for the fans who might not be into football, what happens is the quarterback throws the ball, it's going to get deflected by a lineman likely because it has to be catchable, right, after you throw it. So they throw it, it gets deflected by a lineman. Everybody's natural instinct at that point is to bat the ball down. So right. not only does, does that have to not happen, but no other player needs to be in the area that could potentially catch it. And it has to basically come right back to the quarterback – and then the quarterback has to catch it, right? So he passed it, deflected it, catches it, and then after that has to be able to have a clear path or enough blocking to make it to the end zone. I mean, think about everything that has to happen right for that to actually occur. Yeah. Wow. Hey, how about this one? Speaking of deflection, what about a line drive off the pitcher's head that comes back and the catcher catches it? <laughs> how, how, by the way, how is that – in the school book, how's that put out as? Is that a, is that an F one two? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, line out one two. Yeah, it would be, it would be one two <sighs> in the school books. I'll tell you, I'll, let me. We'll leave it with this unless you get another one. But for me, the only thing is a guy that ran track. I would like to see a world record where it just eclipses the most mind, like a thirty foot long jump, for instance. Twenty nine something's a record right now. Or like a 50-foot triple jump, the record's around 47, I think. Something that's just so far beyond the number, right, at that point in time that you're just like, what did I just see? WTF, right? Yeah. 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 That's yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of – right. there's a few of them out there.
It's fun. It's hey, fun. fans, if you got listening to us, any fans, if you got any, chime in. Send us a little uh, in IG. Send us something on Twitter. Send us something on our Facebook page. But think about something you think is incredibly rare in sports that you'd like to see live. We'd like to know about that. Speaking of rare, I just want one other thing, PB. Everybody talks about the dynasty of the Dubs, the Warriors. But think about this for a minute. If they don't win this series, they go three and three. How much of a great dynasty is that in the last eight years? That's, 500. That's another good point. I mean, to get to six championships in a in an eight year span is pretty, pretty incredible. Um, going three and three. I mean, if you think about it for a second, you know, Tom Brady, as great as he is, you know, he, he's won seven Super Bowls. He's also lost three, you know, and he did lose three of those in a span of, you know, however many he lost in 07, I believe he lost in 10, and he lost again in 17 or six, whatever it was, right? So, yeah, the ones in the Eagles. Has, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he had a span yeah. of time there when he was going to Super Bowls, but losing some. And, you know, it just really depends in the end of the day how many how many you come away with. But, yeah, three and three is, is nothing to, you know. I That's no dynasty. That's no dynasty in my mind. You don't think so, huh? You're 500. I mean, we're not, we're not giving trophies to 500 people, right? I mean, every teams. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? If you make six championships in eight years in the NBA, is that – I mean, and you go 500 in them? I, I get it, but listen, the, the Bills went to four straight Super Bowls. I know they lost them all, but are we calling them a great team because they went to four in a row? Right. That's a good point, but you didn't get any out of that, right? So I get it. Way. I get it. Let's look at the other way.